All right. Okay. Looks like we're live. Looks like we're live. We are doing it. And once again, you guys have to watch me do all the background shit that it takes. Um, the live stream is always going to be uh, slightly slower because that's what happens. Uh, let me get this typed out here before I continue talking. All right. Boom. Comment. Done. Hello. Uh, if you are tuning in, thank you for coming in. Um, as people are coming in, do me a favor. Uh, please share this. Please give it a like. Please get it out there to uh, groups, friends, family, enemies, whoever you think would uh, would enjoy uh, content like this. I'm going to share this around. You guys are going to get to watch me do all this stuff. I apologize that this is late. Uh, I am a, a, uh, a, a one man, uh, working machine. Uh, <laughs> so it takes uh, a lot of effort, um, to, to make, to make this sort of stuff come to life. Um, so I, I do, you know, I'm, I'm streaming on my own. I'm coming up with the content on my own. I'm writing it out. I'm doing all the background promotional stuff. So it takes a little bit to get everything up to speed and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kick this thing on, uh, in just a second here. So give me a moment as I share things around, if you would like to leave a comment and, and we'll, we'll throw it up on the screen, uh, and, and we'll talk about it as we're getting things going here. Um, so, uh, thank you for tuning in. Stay tuned guys. Hang tight, hang tight, just a few minutes and, uh, and we will get this show right on the road. Um, Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, hey, if you guys are tuning in, share this out to some people. Invite some people to to watch this. Start a watch party. Do all the fun things that you can do uh, on the Facebooks to get the word out about this stuff. As I was just saying, I'm a one-man machine. I'm trying to do all this stuff before we get the show on the road. Uh, thank you, guys. I love you guys. Hang tight. Hang tight. We're, we're, we're going to start this thing. Uh, we're going to start this thing just in a few minutes. <laughs> Here we go. Moving as fast as I can. Getting the word out to the people. Gotta do it all by myself. Gotta do it all by myself. I gotta um, copy and paste this little post, but I can't do it too much because if I if I copy and paste it too much, then Facebook doesn't think I'm a real person. That's right. An algorithm questions my reality. Uh, that is the world that we live in, uh, and it is horrifying. Um, so we are going to get the show on the road. Just give me a few, just to hang, to hang in there for just a few minutes, guys. Uh, I appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, I appreciate everybody's, um, you know, but it, like I said, if you want to help, please share this thing out to a bunch of people. And, uh, and that will be, that'll be super, super, super helpful. Uh, because, uh, because I don't, I don't have a staff. I don't have people to do this stuff. Other, other shows do, but, uh, your boy, Krish Mohan does not, he does not. He is, he is a solo, solo working machine. That's how he rolls. That's how I like to do it, folks. That's how I like to do it. Uh, so, you know, help, help a brother out. 
if you would like to. If you don't, you, it's not a necessity. I'm not forcing anybody to do it. I've shared this out to a few groups. Uh, I'll invite some people, and then we'll get the show on the road. So uh, hang tight. I appreciate you guys being in the in the live stream. By the way, there's also a delay. Um, as as if you're if you're unfamiliar with live streaming, if you're unfamiliar with the, with how the Facebookery operates, uh, we are we are operating on a bit of a delay. Um, so you know uh, that keep that in mind as you guys are leaving comments and things of that sort. Um, so, you know, it's, I think right now it's, it's maybe, maybe 30 seconds to a minute behind. It could be more, uh, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, feel free to leave a comment. Hi, Cindy. How you doing? Uh, see, this is, this is how we deal with comments. We, we put it up on the screen and then we go, hello, how's it going, Cindy? It's good to see you. Ha- hope your Sunday is going pretty well. Um, and as always, we'll, th- we'll throw up this little banner uh, about donating if you can. It is not a necessity to donate, but, uh, you know, if you can, that'd be, that'd be dope. If, if not, just go ahead and, and enjoy the stream today, you guys. We're going to be talking about some big topics. We got, some, we got, we got, we got a couple big ones um, that we're going, to be, we're going to be diving into here. Um, as, as we have been the last couple of, uh, couple of days. And as I have been saying on these streams, um, I will be talking a lot about, uh, um, strikes and things like that. So if the, if that is of interest to you, and here's the thing, you're, you're not going to get this shit on corporate, you know, corporate media. They're not going to talk about it. They're just not going to do it. You know, that's not their cup of tea. That's not what they like. You know, they got advertisers. I just got you guys, which is far better than advertisers. Um, what, what's what's John saying? I got a couple comments. Mr. Schulte, Adam Schulte, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well. I miss you too, buddy. I miss you too. Uh we got John Sheehan, the delays in case you start telling the truth about birds and Facebook needs to shut you down. That's true. Uh, that is, that is true. Uh, Cindy, thank you for sharing. I'm doing all right. Uh, I, I am doing okay. I'm surviving through the day. I'm having a bit of a late day today. You guys, uh, I'm having a bit of a late day, uh, because, um, you know, I've been, uh, I've been, ex- I've been, I've been exhausted. <laughs> That's basically it. Uh, I've, I've been very tired lately. I, I think it's just, uh, I need to, I need to get us, I need to get some kind of a, a regular schedule going. Uh, and there's been a lot of changes in the last three weeks, not just dealing with this, with this, you know, the, the quarantine situation that we're in, um, just dealing with just fucking everything. Uh, so it's been, it's been a little bit of a challenge, um, to get, uh, to get everything that I need to get done. And then, you know, I get burned out by the end of the day uh, and you know, that's not fun that no, no one likes getting burned out. You know, who's, who's out there. that's like, you know what I want? I just want to be burned out. And at the end of the day, I just want to be sad and alone and crying in a room by myself. That's life. That's a good life right there. Uh, no one, no one wants that sort of shit. Um, okay. All right. I think we've invited some people. I think we got a bunch of people, uh, ready to go here. Let's take this ticker off. Uh, please, once again, Cindy, thank you for sharing. If you haven't shared this out to 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 some streams and stuff of that sort, uh, even if it's just your personal Facebook thingy, uh, go ahead and share it out. That's super helpful. It helps me out quite a bit. Uh, it, it keeps me uh, sane and present. Um, but like I said, the reason why this is late is we've been going through, uh, I've been going through a lot of changes. I, I got a desk now. Uh, as, as you, and I changed up the backdrop. If you guys can see, I've, I've got some of, uh, most of this stuff is my art, by the way, most of the stuff that you, you see in the backdrop is, is my art, uh, except for this right here that my art teacher did that. Um, maybe I'll do a bigger video and talk about that, uh, at a later time, but we've been, we've all been waiting 10 minutes. This is crazy that it took me fucking 10 minutes to get there. Uh, all right, guys, we're here. We're doing it. We're having a good time. Uh, we're going to talk 
uh, about about some uh, some topics that you're not going to hear in the mainstream. Uh, I've got I've got a little bit of caffeine to help me through this thing once it sort of melts. It's uh, cold brew from Wise Acres. Uh, this is a place in Memphis that my friend Brian works at. Uh, and every time I go to Memphis, he gives me a, a, a nice four pack of the cold brew because uh, he's a sweetheart and he's a he's a sweet angel baby. Uh, so if you're in Memphis, Wise Acre Brewing Company, they're fucking amazing. Uh, but let's get into it, guys. We're going to get right into these topics. Uh, let's talk about unions versus right to vote. Right to work. Uh, this has been a topic that I've been wanted to talk about for a little while. Um, and uh, it's been on my mind for a while. So uh, part of the thing is, is a lot of people have uh, a lot of misnomers about unions. They, it, it's a controversial um, uh, topic that, you know, people don't really want to address. Um, and especially now, I think it's very important, especially now that we're seeing a lot of strikes happening across the country with, uh, with Amazon, with the Pittsburgh sanitation uh, folks, the uh, Whole Foods, uh, I think McDonald's just went on strike. We're, we're going to see these essential workers uh, go on strike. And here's the deal, right? We are all essential. Like CEOs, not so essential. CFOs, not so essential, right? Libraries are essential. Grocery stores are essential, right? Educators are essential. Art is essential. CFOs are not essential. <laughs> it's just how it works. Um if you if you are a CEO, pay your employees better and your taxes. Pay those too; those are fun because uh, because we all got to do them, and and we don't we don't know where your tax havens are. You know we we haven't we haven't looked into the eyes of the devil to find what particular spot in Delaware. That's right, Delaware is a tax haven. Uh, so it's important to talk about unions because unions. Uh, help the worker out. That's what they do. That's what their primary purpose is. Um, before unions, uh, let's talk about pre-union days, right? But way back in in the uh, eighteen early eighteen hundreds, you you had people working twelve hour days. You had people working seven days a week. You had dangerous work conditions with no protections at all. You had a lot of child labor, like kids were working in these places, places, and you had low pay. A lot of people just weren't uh, paid very well. Right. Uh, and then you had uh, you, you had things like the Central Labor Union rise up um, in the early 1900s um, and they fought to improve conditions and compensations for the worker. And I've been saying this all week and I feel like I have to keep iterating this until all uh, eight billion human beings on this planet understand this, which is why it's imperative to, to, to share all the shit. <laughs> uh, but. Labor unions are fighting for basic human rights. That's what they're doing, right? When people go on strike, it's basically they're they're, they're basically saying, "Hey, uh, this company is not granting basic human rights, and that's what we're fighting for." And every time we we are asking for basic human rights, uh, they keep shutting us down. They keep telling us that we're that that we're not worth it, uh, and then uh, and then and then they don't grant that, so we have to go on strike, and that's what we're going to fight for. So that's it. And that's basically what we're doing. Right. So anybody that comes out and says that they don't want to stand by these labor unions, they don't want to stand by these strikers, that these strikers are lazy and they're terrible and they're evil and they're awful. It, they're, they're just basically saying, I don't fucking care about basic human rights. I don't give a shit about good working conditions or fair compensation. You know, I care about the CEO. They are essential. OK, but with without these CEOs shackling us to these workstations, we would all just just be masturbating into the wind. Is that what you want? A bunch of wind masturbators, you, you six lazy strikers. That's essentially the direction that they're going, right? So with these with this history of strikes that we that we see um, throughout the 1800s, throughout the 19, early, especially the early 1900s, we got the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which advocated and put into law an eight-hour work week, overtime pay. It outlawed um, uh, kids under 14 working. Uh, we, we got we got weekends. Uh, you know, we got weekends because of this thing. We got today, like today, off. You know, today's part of the weekends is Sunday. Uh, that that uh, when when this video is being live streamed, it's a Sunday. Uh, you know, that's that's a big deal. 
we wouldn't have this, you know, and we needed Sundays uh, because that was a day. Uh, that's the only day, as we all know, it's the only day uh, where Jesus is allowed to talk. That's uh, that's that's sort of the trade off that happened. Um, you know, he got to come back uh, after a three day, uh, three day break. And he bargained, he collectively bargained with the Lord, uh, to come back for, for after three days. Um, and then, uh, the, the trade-off was that uh, the only day that he could talk to the flock was particularly on Sundays. So, you know, that's why you got to go to church on Sundays. That's what, none of the other days matter. They don't count. So if you go to church on Wednesday, uh, it, it doesn't really count. It's it's, uh, it's fucking Sunday. It's the today's the day that matters. That's the day that matters. So uh, we got the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, um, and you know we got eight-hour workday, overtime pay, outlawed kids under 14 uh, weekends. We got all these fair labor as as the name of the act itself suggests. We got fair labor standards, things that we were fighting for. We we got them because we striked, because we organized, because we supported unions, um, and now essentially. We're at a point where we need to we, we need to go back to doing that again. We need to go back to supporting unions. We need to go back to striking. We need to go back to organizing um, as the collective working class because all of these laws, all of these standards that were set back in 1938 uh, are being circumvented, are being, uh, the, you know, the, these corporations, these CEOs are spitting in the face of the people that 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 came up with this fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. And how are they doing that? We're circumventing these laws with our current conditions by, uh, by people have to have two to three jobs now. There are people that have two to three different jobs. Uh, this circumvents the 40 hour work week because now with these two to three jobs, a lot of people are working well over 40 hours a week. I know I do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm self employed, but in order to get all the stuff that I need to get done, uh, you know, I do end up sitting at my computer at my desk for, for, you know, 12 hours a day. That's just, that's just sort of the, the nature of the game. Um, unfortunately, and that is a choice that I make, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in, in terms of myself, but I also know there, uh, there's a bunch of my friends out there that work two, three different jobs. And on top of that are content creators, right. That, that put out YouTube videos that, that go do stand up comedy that perform, uh, music and poetry and spoken work. They work two to three jobs. That That's, that's 60 plus hours a week minimum that's 60 plus hours a week. Right. And, and some of them don't have weekends because, you know, they work on the weekends as, as performing artists, if, if that's what they do, or they work as weekends because they're part of the service industry. Uh, and that's what they do, you know, uh, or, or their security guards or whatever it is, but they're working on, they're working weekends. So there goes the idea of the weekend, right. Their second or third job, um, is, is, is on a weekend, uh, and then there's no overtime pay because even though you're working past 40 hours, you're working past 40 hours at a different job. You're part-time at two, three different jobs, which means that you don't get benefits anyway, right? Like that's how, that's another way that these companies circumvent that part-time, part-time employees are not protected by any of these laws. They, they don't have any benefits. And the only benefits there are, are to the fucking CEOs and the corporations. That's who gets the benefit at the end of the day. We've lost our weekends, which means that, you know, it's like we're not working for the weekend anymore. What we are working for is for a CEO, Robert Barron, to get richer and richer and make far more money for himself or herself. Greed, greed doesn't see genders, okay? Ladies can be greedy too, okay? Non-binary folks can be greedy too, all right? Greed, greed, greed transcends all identities. So it's important. Okay, so let's let's talk about what a labor union actually is, right? Because not a lot of people really know what a labor union is. Uh, labor unions are a collection of workers that unite to make decisions about the conditions that affect their jobs. Um, and these decisions that they make are called collective bargaining, uh, which is a negotiation between an employer and a labor union to talk about the improvements of the conditions that they need, right? And basically, the labor unions or trade unions, whatever you want to call them, uh, bring the worker to the negotiating table, because right now uh, that is not the case, right? Uh, we are not represented at the negotiating table when decisions are made, uh, either on a uh, on a company level, on a corporate level, or on a legislative level. Um, they we're just we're just not there. We're just not taken into account. We, we are not thought about. 
when this sort of stuff happens, right? Uh, for example, the most recent one is the stimulus bill that just went out. Were we present? <laughs> I don't know. No one consulted me. Did anyone consult you guys out there? Uh, I doubt it, right? Like, we, and, and no one that represents us, no one that represents our interests was really pr particularly present at these negotiations. All, the, all these negotiations happened behind closed doors, you know, in some fucking smoke-filled room, you know, where, where a bunch of these rich assholes were sitting there. Like, that's why they came out and they were like, we're going to have a $4.3 trillion corporate slush fund and we're going to allocate $500 billion to give to whatever fucking lobbyist, uh, you know, tickles my balls first. Like, that's essentially how, uh, th you know, they made that decision. They're like, oh, but we'll give you guys 1200 bucks. You guys good? You guys happy with that? Okay, we don't know how long the situation is going to last because we're not really going to make a plan for it. Uh, we're, we're going to kind of, uh, sit around and, uh, and count our money. And that's going to take a long time. That's going to take, I mean, w what we did is we converted all of our cash, um, into $1 bills and we're not going to count it. What we're going to do is we're going to watch, uh, one of you count it. And for every, um, hundred million that we get, we're going to give you $1 and you're welcome. Trickle down economics, people. Trickle down economics, right? So basically, that's what the, unions put us into that room to go. Hey, <laughs> maybe you don't give four point three trillion dollars to to corporations that don't fucking need it and have no record of ever trickling that down to the employee, trickling that down to the working class. That's never been a fucking thing that's happened in like the 300 years of history that this country has like ever. <laughs> so it, basically the unions put out this collective bargaining agreement and this collective bargaining agreement is a contract between the employer and the employee that, uh, that, uh, that is agreed upon that benefits all employees, whether you're part of the union or not, all of the workers get the benefit that is agreed upon. Everybody gets it. And none of these, no, and there can't be any changes or anything to these agreements, unless we go back and uh, and and the union is is back at the negotiating table on behalf of the working class. Um, and so, one of the controversial things dealing with unions in this regard are dues, because unions do have dues. Um, you you do have to pay union dues, uh, and and I believe one of the statistics that I read. Uh, was that it's one to one point five percent of your paycheck uh, is is what goes into union dues if you choose to join um, a union, but uh, regardless of that, you're still protected, right? That's their obligation. Um, and dues, uh, what they do is they help cover the cost of collective bargaining, uh, which is lawyers. Right. That's <laughs> that's what you need to pay for because these corporations can afford all these lawyers and all these lawyers, uh, all these corporate lawyers do is look for little loopholes. It's all they're looking for. They're looking for little loopy loopholes, you know, to, to kind of like sneak in between to, to fuck over the worker to be like, aha, but this law does it because of the way this comma is positioned and the semicolon. Uh, it means that uh, that the, the CEO uh, gets to take uh, 80 percent of the money that you make uh, for, uh, for, for lavish funds. And that's uh, because that's that semicolon. That's what that semicolon represents. So they, so they have to basically find lawyers uh, that can circumvent that. So collective bargaining, uh, grievance and services, which is uh, more lawyers, uh, and then political funds for supporting particular pro-union candidates, right? Um, and this is sort of one of the ones that does get a little controversial in the sense that uh, should these unions uh, be supporting uh, political candidates. And my counter to that is should corporations uh, support political candidates too, right? Because that's another thing that we see is, is a bunch of corporate lobbyists. We see a bunch of corporations supporting political candidates and we see a bunch of candidate political uh, people, people in the, in the Senate and the house of representatives uh, in uh, higher offices than that uh, basically support corporations that end up, making them richer once they get out of office. So, you know, we, you have corporate lobbyists, you have the lobbying machine itself. Uh, so the people that are like, hey, unions are, are are supporting candidates that are saying that unions are pretty cool. I mean, aren't corporations essentially 
doing the same thing. So shouldn't we talk about just not having money in politics? Is, isn't that like a bigger fucking subject to, ha- <laughs> to be talking about? Why are people getting pissed off at unions basically putting their support behind a candidate that talks about how unions are cool? Now, the dues in and of themselves um, in 2018 on average is an average. So that means just that there, there are some above this number, some below this number, uh, right? So it's $400 a year or $16 a month, something along those lines is sort of um, what, it, what it averaged out to, right? Uh, so uh, $400 a year, $16 a month. And the reason why the number is, is what it is is because you're not just giving to, if you're part of a union, you're not just giving to a local union, but you might be giving to a national union as well. Uh, so that brings up the question, if there are local chapters that you have to support, as well as a national chapter that the local chapter is under, um, what about just creating one big union? Uh, that was actually, that was the talk uh, in, in 1919, um, w- when I talked about the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike, which is a video that you can go check out on my pages uh, that I talked about earlier this week. I talked about it on Friday. If uh, if th- those of you that are in the stream watched that video on Friday, they were talking about having one big union that collectively recognized every single person. And the idea would be that maybe we bump the number up a little bit, right? So so if union dues are one to one and a half percent of your paycheck, maybe we bump that up to three to five percent of your paycheck. And we give it to this one big union that collectively, you know, um, is is spending money for for collective bargaining for all workers, not just specific, you know, it's not just oh retail workers or teachers or so on and so forth, right? Uh, so that's an idea that 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 possibly could work. Uh, that that possibly could be something. Um, and if po- if po- political funds are really a problem. What if the labor unions themselves were a political party, <laughs> right? Like labor is a political party in the UK. Uh, what if we had a working class party? Um, and I know there are some people uh, out there that are trying to um, trying to make that work, trying to figure out how to make that work, right? But what if what if there was a political party that's surrounded specifically around uh, around unions and, and what unions stand for and the, uh, and the philosophies of the working class people. What if that was something that we did? Right. And, and th- again, that would be people funding into that. Um, and at that point, you know, the, the dues, if, if it was a political party, you can't take dues out of somebody's, uh, somebody's paycheck, obviously, but you could make a monthly contribution or, you know, whatever, um, just, just like you su- support uh, every month, a, a person that you find interesting or whatever, right? Like, just like I have some patrons that, uh, support me on a monthly basis, just like Jimmy Dore has that. My buddy Ron Placone has that, right? Like, uh, Eleanor Goldfield has that. Um, it would kind of be the same thing is, is if you want somebody, um, as a political party represents the interests of the worker that would bring you to the negotiating table, um, in, uh, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of collective bargaining. And, and I think that would dynamically also change the structure of the way that the Congress would be run too, because then you would have, you would have your Democrats, your, your Republicans, your progressive, and then the worker party and each, and then you, you divide up the house so that, you know, it's like, okay, let's say hundred people are in, in the Senate, right? You would have 25 people that represented Democrats, 25 people that represented uh, Republicans, 25 people that represented the worker, 25% that represented progressive ideals. And then that way, now you have an even amount of more of this political representation. So, so now we got, we got these ideas that are kind of, that, that are changing the dynamic structure uh, of, of the way that, uh, that policy is run, the way that you would negotiate in, in regards to these political ideologies, rather than it being that the union is taking money out of somebody's paycheck um, and, uh, and giving it to a political candidacy, because a lot of this shit is like, oh, well, you know, but most of these unions, they support the Democrats. No one's, t- no one's, uh, supporting, 
uh, you know, Republicans. And, and uh, you know, my uh, comment to that uh, would be maybe uh, Republicans uh, should suck less. Or, I mean, the Democrats need to suck less, too, because they, they also suck. And uh, my belief is, is that we need a, a, a third party that does represent the worker, which is why I thought this idea in the first place. <laughs> Now, part of this problem, too, part of the problem with dudes when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, unions is that sometimes you got to pay the dues whether you're part of a union or not. Right. That's that's sort of um, uh, that's sort of that's sort of the thing with certain companies that are represented by a union. And the reason for that is. Because regardless of whether you belong to a union or not, uh, they will go to bat for you because they go to bat for all workers, all of them, every single one. We talked about that earlier, right? That's kind of what that collective bargaining is. Regardless of whether you're part of the union or not, you get the benefits of it. So to me, it sound, it's, it's more or less like if these guys are, if these guys are trying to benefit you, if these guys are actually hearing out what your needs are and then going to bat for those needs, why wouldn't you support them financially? Right. And then, and then there's all this notion of, of, of like, oh, well, you know, these intrinsically philosophically good things shouldn't be involved with money. It should, it should only be the crony corrupt people that's that's who need to be involved with the money don't don't bring in these uh these nicey nice people and it's like oh, okay cool so you don't want these nicey nice people to like eat and be alive <laughs> is, is that what the argument is i get shit for that too it's like i talk about these ideas i talk about this stuff and i talk about you know being compassionate and good to each other and bringing us all together and all that sort of stuff uh, and then people will get mad at me and they're like oh you have a patreon or or you're trying to take donations or or you charge a cover for your shows and it's like yes because one of the things i like to do uh, is eat a, a, and drink to to sustain myself and be alive so i can continue to bring uh you know levity to uh difficult topics uh is that not you don't want me to be alive um <laughs> and it's, but it's, it's it's such a it's such a bizarre ideology though to me is like you can't have a financial you, you can't you can't back something up financially um that is specifically has some sort of altruistic need uh so you know and and this is the thing is like the right wing uses this uh, as an effort to chastise unions that are, once again, I to reiterate the point, fighting for your basic human rights as a worker. That's what they're fighting for. If you want somebody that is championing for the, for the basic human rights of you as a worker, then that's what the unions are doing. And, and the right chastises them because they're like, oh, but they want the money. And, and sometimes even if you don't want to be a part of their club and even though they're going to fight for you, whether you are or aren't, they're going to, they're going to take some money from you. They're fucking going to take, how dare they? That is disgusting. That is disgusting. Okay. And it's, it's not disgusting when a CEO does it by, uh, by stagnating wages <laughs> and not paying their employees and using part-time, uh, part-time employees to not give them benefits to the, you know, they don't have to pay for their health care so that they make more money. It's it's I think it's like 400 percent more is what a CEO makes than like the average working person. 400 percent more. That's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, and this is where right to work comes in. Right. That's our uh, second topic of conversation. Right to work. Um, basically, this gear, this this is a um, a rule that's put into place primarily by the conservatives, primarily by Republicans, uh, that guarantees that a person d is not compelled to join a union or um, contribute to them financially in any way. So, you know, the, the, these companies where it, they are union represented or they do partner with the union and regardless of what happens, you know, maybe a half a percent of your paycheck every month or every paycheck goes to a union, um, right to work states uh, basically make that not happen. Which, uh, which depowers the union by defunding them. Um, 
you know, because they, they're not getting any sort of corporate incentive. They're not, they're not backed by a government or anything. Um, they are, they are f- completely fueled by people that want to join the union that by, by membership, by dues and all that sort of stuff. So that's how they can, uh, afford to be part of the collective bargaining aspect of things. Right. And, and what these right to work laws do is they allow the employer to essentially, um, make rules that they want to make without consulting the employee. There's no democratization in the workplace. It's, it's like, these are the rules. This is what we are deciding to do. Uh, and that's how it is. And if you don't like it, you can fuck right off is sort of the way that these guys go about doing it. So they get to stagnate wages. They get to hire and fire people for whatever reasons they want to, they want, they can, you know, move their business to a different country, completely laying off hundreds of thousands of workers without any say or anything. So it really, it really takes the democracy out of the workplace. Um, that's what these right to work laws really do. And, and in order to, uh, in order to maintain, in order to make sure that there are not people that are encouraged to, um, to join unions, a lot of companies will, uh, will use propaganda videos, uh, to, uh, um, to make sure that people don't join unions to, to, you know, uh, to, to discourage people from joining unions. And, and they keep saying like, Oh, but this is, a, this is for your best interest because the corporation has the best interest. The employer, the CEO, the CEO that's never come to visit you. That's never seen, uh, that's never, that's never seen the floor. That's never even met you ever in your life. That doesn't know your life or your strife or any of these sort of things. The person that's the most out of touch cares about you and will do things for you by lining their pockets, right? Like that's how it, and, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, uh, a little bit later, later, but essentially what they're doing, um, with these right to work laws is, uh, is, uh, controlling the means of your labor. That's what they're doing. They're controlling the means of your labor. They get to, they get to seize the, the, the means of production. Um, is essentially how that works, right? And and where this happens, uh, where these right to work laws are present, it's a lot of states in the South, and it's a lot of states in the middle of the country. Basically, uh, it's all of the states that I tour pretty regularly. <laughs> <laughs> like all the states that I go visit. Uh, uh, when oh boy, guys, do you guys remember when touring was a thing? Uh, let's fondly remember touring for a second. Uh. Ah. <laughs> Um, but that's primarily where I tour. Uh, and a lot of people make fun of me for going down South, going into the Midwest, you know, two or three times a year. Uh, and, and these are the states that I tour. So I, I, my tours where I talk about ideas like this, uh, about, about these socialist ideas or whatever, um, those are the right to work states. (laughs) Which is, which I kind of feel like is cool. Like I kind of I kind of think like that's like a that that's 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 like a fun way to bring the the resistance into it, um, because uh, you, you know it's just like me going in to be like, hey, do you believe in right to work? Well, here's why that's a big load of crap, uh, and you shouldn't. Unions. <laughs> Maybe I'll wake some people up. You know, that's the goal, right? Is to just fucking wake some people up. Here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, unions have a duty to protect every single worker, whether they're members or not. Can you say that about a corporation? Based on everything we know about corporations, can you really say that 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 a corporation is uh, is willing to represent you for who you are, regardless of whether you believe in that corporation or not, whether you want to work? You can't, right? Like. Like Starbucks doesn't go out there and try to represent all coffee workers and be like, this is how we should treat all coffee employees, right? They don't, they just don't do that sort of stuff. Unions do. Unions, unions are out there fighting for the working class, whether, whether you're part of a union or not. You know, these strikers uh, are out there fighting for the, the benefit of all workers, whether you're a Whole Foods employee or not. It doesn't matter. They're fighting. They're fighting on the behalf of, of the collective working class, um, and this is the issue, right? It, it, it lies in the fact um, that unions usually support left wing candidates. They usually support liberal candidates. The right wing doesn't like this and has created the right to work laws, 
uh, but you know, and and they're trying to defund the unions. They're trying to strip the union of 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 any power that it might have to democratize the workplace, to bring um, the working class um, in, in, into the negotiating table. But here's the thing: if we can all agree that what unions and these strikes are really fighting for are basic human rights in the workplace, for you to be treated properly, to to have um, a safe working conditions to be paid and compensated a fair amount so that you can you can live your life and take care of your family uh, it, it to 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 you know work uh, to have weekends so you can have some time to rest so you can have some time to rest in your evening so you have some freedom with your life to if to pursue other things to pursue family to pursue your passions to pursue all these other things these are basic human rights. This is neither a left wing nor a right wing issue. It is a matter of human rights. And that's all it is. Right. So this is not a political idea to me. Um, this is not something that's politicizing anything. Uh, people that like to say that like to ignore the values of of of, of basic human rights, uh, you know, because they're like, don't talk about it because it's over politicization and we don't want to overly politicize uh, any of this stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's different. It's a different thing. It's a, yeah, it's a, it, we have to talk about it, not because it's too political or anything, because it's ba about basic human rights. We should be talking about this. And some people blame um, business failure on unions as well, right? That's something that I, that I saw from the other side. Um, the uh, the opposition like to bring up um, business failure, that when people join unions, that it leads to the death of the business. It leads to the death of the markets. The markets, are, oh, the markets will, will, will tank. Well, yeah, because the markets are d directly connected to, to how well rich people are doing. It's not connected to, to how well, you know, the, the average middle class is doing. It's not d d related to um, how, how well, you know, um, you and I are doing. It's just not. It's connected to how well rich people are doing. And if collective bargaining and the unions sit and bring us to the, to the negotiating table and go, hey, uh, we don't feel very particularly represented by when you're slashing our wages, you're slashing our work conditions, you're forcing us into poverty, you're creating this insane wealth gap, and we don't, we're not going to fucking stand for that shit anymore. And it makes, you know, Jeff Bezos, who makes $165 billion a year, uh, it, it, and it brings his 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 value down to to one hundred and twenty million dollars a year just so that the rest of his employees can actually like live a decent life. Holy shit. Who fucking cares? Who fucking cares? You still have one hundred and twenty billion dollars. You megalomaniacal psychopath. Oh, I really don't like that guy. I don't know if you can tell you guys. But if the business does fail then why are we blaming unions? We should be blaming the way that the business is practicing. If everything hinges on, on the fact that a CEO or, or you know, the, the top dog makes a majority of the wealth, then I don't know if that, like, if, if your business doesn't care about its employees, then why would anybody work for that business? That's a problem within your business practices and your business philosophies. That's not the union's fault. The unions basically came and said, hey, you should, if you're going to practice this business, you should practice it uh, ethically by, by, you know, uh, offering uh, decent wages and so on and so forth to, to the to people that work, um, work within your company. You should treat your employees that, that are, that are as important as you, as essential as you to this company, to the worth of this company, they should be treated equally. Um, so, so again, it's not about hierarchy at all in, in regards uh, to all this to me. It's, it's about, it's, it's about importance and purpose and what your, uh, position in this company is because all of us serve a purpose. Um, so, uh, a lot of corporations don't like this, right? Don't like unions. They don't like people unionizing. Amazon is one of them. Um, Amazon, as well as a ton of other corporations are for right to work and what they've done is uh and like a lot of companies do this walmart does this whole foods does this a lot of companies will have training videos that they will show people where um they will talk about unions and how unionization is a bad thing that that if you see somebody unionizing you should you should tell a floor supervisor you should get the word out you should 
disband any sort of meetings that involve, you know, uh, talking about a union or anything of that sort. Right. Um, and the way they frame it is the video that I watched uh, about Amazon, particularly uh, it said that unions are bad for customers, employees, and their profits. Well, no shit, your profits. That's really what you care about, but it's nice that you threw the customers in on top of that. Right. It's like, Oh my God, can you guys imagine if we had to slow down production and actually like treat human beings like human beings, could you imagine getting your package in maybe seven to 10 days? Oh, do you guys remember when that would happen? Seven to 10 days to get your packages. Holy shit. Some people killed themselves because they weren't able to get their uh, Bluetooth headphones. It, that Their blood is on the union's pants. Okay, it does not fit the model of Amazon and it's one day sh- it, it, shipping. Okay, and we're, we're trying to make that better for our customers and our employees like it. Our employees like working that much. They like they like pumping things out. They like being on the brink of total exhaustion and near death at every shift possible. That's what they want. That's what they at least that's what we tell them they want, which means that's what they want, which means that's what they want. One of the things in the Amazon video itself say, uh, said that um, uh, people to to bust union to, to talks uh, should they should act as spies, uh, and they're like, "But don't be spies, though. Just like tell us if you hear about it." So right in in 2019, um, so in 2019 we saw a shit ton of strikes, right? And and uh, Amazon there there was a lot of walkouts, a lot of strikes involving Amazon, and. Um, Three unions that have been talking to Amazon workers to help them unionize uh, are the Teamsters, the R- RWDSU, and the UFCW. I think those are both like retail, um, retail or manufacturing uh, uh, unions there. And Bezos, this is a quote from Bezos from one of the videos I watched. Uh, we don't believe we need unions to be the intermediary between us and the employee, but it's their choice. Right. It's the oh, but it's the employee's choice is how he puts it. Oh, the employee, they can join a union if they want. We're we're not. I mean, I'm a benevolent God King. I'm, I'm a benevolent megalomaniac. You know. If they want to, they totally can. Oh, my God. It's not like a big deal. It's not like I'm going to fire them. And that's exactly what they do. If you unionize or if you organize a strike. You get fired. And we saw that. We saw that earlier in the week when when there was the Amazon walkout <laughs> just one week ago. Chris Smalls, the the the, the gentleman uh, that uh, uh, organized the walkout, um, got fired. And uh, there's another guy, Rashad Long, in 2018. He organized um, uh, a strike as well against Amazon, and he got fired. And they always get fired for these like bogus safety claims, right? That's what Chris Malls got fired for. They were like, oh, but he wasn't taking enough precautions uh, for, um, you know, this, this COVID that we're seeing. Okay. He wasn't, he wasn't taking the precautions uh, and we felt very unsafe uh, by keeping him in the building. Okay. And literally the reason why the strike happened is because somebody in Amazon got diagnosed. Somebody in Amazon got diagnosed and they sent that person home, okay, and then they didn't do anything else. They didn't sanitize the place. They didn't shut it down for a week. They, didn't, they weren't like, hey, we're going uh, to pay for everybody in the factory to get tested so, you can, so we can see if this, thing, um, if this thing spread or not, right? They didn't do any of that stuff. They were just like, keep working. And in fact, Chris Malls uh, was a manager of one of these warehouses. And when he got the word that somebody was diagnosed in his factory, they basically said, don't tell anybody because then people might want to take paid time off because they, they might think that they're sick and that's really going to drive down our profits. So in order for us to to keep making money in order for us to we got to keep these people in there if they get sick you know whatever fuck them fuck them we'll just we'll just say safety standards and fire them completely completely unrelated right it's like oh the, the strike leader got fired why for the thing that you didn't do sounds like a little bit of projection 
basically, I mean, and basically what these guys are saying is uh, do what we tell you or and shut the fuck up. And if you don't do that, we'll we'll take your livelihood away. That's how these fucking corporations operate. So these companies are complaining about not being able to talk to the employee directly. That's that's what like a bunch of these CEOs that are these like pro right to work CEOs, they all talk that way, right? They're just like, but we want to be, we want to talk to these employees. They're our friends. They're our family. They're part of our corporate family. And you know what we do with family is we treat them like garbage, right? Like that's kind of the way that they, they do it, but it's like, they've never fucking done that. I work for Starbucks uh, for two and a half years and in that two and a half years, I met Howard Schultz, a record-breaking uh, fucking zero times. Never met the guy. Never, And I never heard of him ever talking to anybody. Not once. Not once did I ever hear that Howard Schultz graced his presence inside of a fucking Starbucks to go and hang out with the baristas and listen to our concerns, you know, and listen to, to, to what we're going. Do we have any concerns? With, not fucking once. I bet you Bezos hasn't even fucking seen the inside of one of his warehouses. Why would they do, why would they do that? Why would they do that? They don't give a shit. They're completely out of touch. They're they're literally living in their ivory towers. Why the fuck would they do that? If they actually listened to what their employees had to say and if they actually like cared about what their employees had to say, they wouldn't have to go out and join a union and strike because because they would, they would know that they're fucking being heard. They would know that their voice actually fucking matters in all this stuff, right? If a company was, was isn't listening, if a co- if 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 these employees were just like, hey, we need in, an increase in, um, in in our wages, we need better working conditions, and so on and so forth. And uh, I mean, that was that was the start of every strike. That was the start of every strike in the early 1900s. That's how it all started, right? The if you go back and watch the videos that I made about the 1919 Seattle and Winnipeg strike, the 1934 San Francisco strike, and what we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, it, it, if you look at all those things, the beginning of every single strike, the beginning of the of, of the unions getting involved is them trying to negotiate with the employer, and the employer just giving them the old middle finger. And tell them to go fuck themselves. Two to three percent. That's all it takes to start a revolution. Two to three percent of the population being on board with a movement is all it takes to start a revolution. That's it. It's all it takes. Um, that's that's all we need to to start a revolution. Uh, so you know that's why it's important to talk about these ideas. Right. And, and when we talk about jobs, when we talk about people being employed and everybody says, oh, I have a great job. I, I, I like the people I work with. I like my benefits. You know, I, I like um, I like the parking spot that I have. I like, you know, the the Friday lunches that we get. I like casual Fridays. Those are fun. Those are dope. Look, all those things are, are important, but those are not the only things that define a job. Right. I think when it comes to it, what, what aren't we here? Are you finding meaning in your job? No one talks about that when you talk about having a good job, right? Do you find purpose in your job? No one talks about that. We're talking about jeans on a Friday. We're, we're, we're talking about Applebee's gift cards. You know, we're, we're talking about getting health insurance where you still have to make a copay. We're talking about dental. Those are important. I'm not saying that they're not, but it's just more than just benefits and coworkers and jeans on a Friday. It's about, are you happy at your job? Is your job providing you fulfillment and happiness at your job? And they don't talk about that sort of stuff. That sort of stuff is not addressed. Um, And, you know, eventually we're going to have to negotiate for that. (laughs) That's going to have to be part of our collective bargaining uh, strategy. That's going to be part of the collective bargaining conversation. Uh, is is uh, is uh, is is meaning that meaningfulness of your job, the fulfillment, the happiness that you that you get from job. It shouldn't just be about uh, your pay uh, or uh, or whether you can you 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 know you wear you wear some jeans. You, you you're getting that Applebee's gift card, 
That's not what it should be about. That's not what it should be about. All right. Uh, let, let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, if you guys have not done so, please share this out to, to some folks. Uh, Eric, uh, no, it's 800 times more, 800 times more. Oh, the, that's the corporate between, between the CEOs and the, and the lower people. It's 800 times more. Uh, by the way, this is something that happens to me a lot is when you type in Chris, this happens to me when I, t- when I talk in the third person sometimes, uh, but that's, it's not important why. Uh, it does change my name to, to Krishna, which is a god, and I have no interest in being that, by the way. No interest in it. That's too much responsibility. That's a lot of fla- uh, it's a lot of power. I mean, uh, Krishna had, like, a lot of women around him, and, you know, I have trouble just it, it, it dealing with uh, one. Uh, but Eric brings up a good point. It's 800 times. I said it's 400. It's actually double that. So it's 800 times. That's insane, by the way. That's fucking crazy, right? So when people come out and, and, and say, well, CEOs deserve that money, it's like, do they deserve 800 times more? Are they doing 800 times more of the work? Like, I doubt it. <laughs> like, I fucking doubt it. <laughs> John Sheon, very uh, excellent musician. Uh, John Sheon, uh, check him out. I think he's doing some live streams as well. Um, my union job told me that they would, wouldn't do anything when the governor asked non-essential businesses to close because, uh, compliance was voluntary at that point. Uh, even that change, they still do nothing. I left and filed for unemployment. Yeah, there you go. There you go. They did, they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. Uh, thank you for leaving that comment, John. Brenda Leeds, uh, it's a delightful Brenda Leeds. Who wears jeans anymore? Well, I mean, in in the uh, in the world we are living in, um, I, I haven't worn jeans in three weeks. You guys, I have not worn jeans in three weeks. Oh man, uh, I'm liking it. I'm I'm okay with it. But eventually, I feel like I'm gonna. I you know, here's the thing: is I did find some pairs of jeans that I'm very happy and excited about. Um, and now I, you know, when the fuck am I going to wear them next? I don't know. I don't know. And, and that's part of the thing that's, uh, that's killing me. Oh, Eric, uh, correction. Okay. I looked up the average CEO pay is 271 times, uh, the nearly $58,000 a year medium pay. So 271 times. Okay. So, okay. So that's, that's what it is. That's what it is now is 200, which is still like, why? They're still not doing that much more work, right? Like that's sort of the point that I'm trying to make. <laughs> is what is it like what does it see like i've asked this question so many fucking times and people just give me like these these you know jargony answers of like what does a ceo do and they're like well they got the market watches and the bond payments and the security as uh uh, the um it you know it's just uh you know it's just fine uh, I'm going to, I'm going to read this last comment from John and we're going to move to the next segment. I'm sitting here drawing as I listen to you. I'm actually sketching a Rob Liefeld character as you, as you're aware, Liefeld started his career with Marvel comics and, and left to found uh, image comics because he wanted to control, he wanted to have control over his own career. Yes. Yes. I do know that. Uh, I like, I like Rob Liefeld a lot, actually. Um, yes. Uh, so, so there you go. There you go. There's an example of somebody uh, that wasn't getting uh, fulfillment uh, uh, from from his uh, his job and uh, and left his company uh, to to do something more to do something more. Uh, so uh, yes, you should uh, you should all you should all seize your own destiny. Be self determining. Uh, John's live stream Monday eight p.m. Uh, Monday eight p.m. Every Monday eight p.m. So tomorrow, uh, Naomi Klein. Uh, has Nip Clubs really movie that takes shows the factory workers taking the factory and doing the management's job and they're asked the same question, what does management do? Yeah, I think that's that's an important thing, right? But that's also like that that also goes into transparency. And I think I and I think a lot of um a lot of the things when you deal with uh when you deal with like upper upper management and stuff like that, there is less and less transparency about what they do. <laughs> There is less and less transparency about what they do. 
uh, you know, there's a lot of closed door meetings, but that's, but that's the other point to it too, right? If, if a company is run by a board, why isn't one or two seats of that board, uh, members from the working class members from the, the floor, you know, like if you, if it, like, why isn't, isn't a, like at Starbucks, for example, I'm using Starbucks because I'm more familiar with, with that structure is, if you're on the board, why isn't there a, a a somebody that's a manager of a store that's part of that board, somebody that's a shift supervisor that's part, and a barista that's part of that board? You know, and if you have board meetings that you're going to change a bunch of shit, you need their input as well. They're the ones that are going to so to you know that that way there is transparency out there um, for these people. Like there there is transparency for for the worker out there, and then now we get a little bit more understanding of. Of what exactly is it that you do? Uh, Lifefield did create cable. Yes. Uh, and who doesn't love cable? Uh, just a red conning machine that cable is. Uh, boy, we could use cable right now, huh? Could, that would be fun. What if cable came back and just retconned this whole situation? Uh, <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> Red content for the worker. <laughs> All right, folks, we're going to move to the next uh, next uh, portion of uh, of our discussion, which is the Great Railroad Strike of eighteen seventy seven. Uh, this is part of um, the series that I'm going to be doing, where I'm going to be talking about some uh, a strike uh, that we have seen in the in the last hundred to two hundred years. Um, that uh, that whether it helped the working class or it didn't help the working class, that there is something that we can learn from it. Um, so far, we've talked about the. Uh, I know I keep mentioning it, but I'm mentioning it just in case there's some new people that keep keep popping into the live stream and sticking around. Uh, 1919 Seattle General Strike, uh, 1919 Winnipeg General Strike, and the uh, 1934 uh, San Francisco General Strike is what we've covered. We've also talked about what it takes to make a general strike. Uh, we've talked about the current strikes and walk-offs that are taking place right now, um, as well as the GE protests to make ventilators uh, instead of jet engines uh, when nobody is fucking flying. So um, in that regard, I wanted to continue talking about some of the bigger strikes that we have seen, some of the important strikes and some of the not-so-important strikes, strikes that we might not even know happened. And I, for one, did not know that this strike happened. And and uh, and this kind of has um, some of the same elements, some of these similar elements. Uh, and, um, and that's sort of my hope with this, is by talking about these strikes, we can see some of these elements, um, uh, you know, that historically take place. So um, when we when we support the strikers of Whole Foods and Amazon and McDonald's and the Pittsburgh Sanitation Department, um, we can see how how the opposition is fighting back. We can learn some of their tactics. So when we see it, we recognize it, and we know how how not to react to it because we know that uh, we know what it is. Um, so uh, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 uh, was in Baltimore. That that was sort of the epicenter of it um, but, uh, in Camden Yards, and over a hundred thousand workers were involved a over a hundred thousand workers were involved right and um the reason why this is so monumental is because first of all the railroad was the first nationalized industry in america uh and uh, at that point in in the uh, the late 1800s uh john garrick who was a very wealthy businessman uh was the president of the railroads uh bno i think he owned uh bno for 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 some monopoly fans out there. Um, and he was described as a visionary, right? I feel like all rich people are kind of described as visionary, right? Like, I feel like at one point, somebody even looked at Jeff Bezos and was like, boy, that guy's a visionary on how to bring slavery back to the working class. I mean, that guy is a real <laughs> fucking visionary. Uh, but, but John Garrick believed that the, the uh, railroads were the future. Uh, and uh, boy, howdy, uh, he kind of uh, was proved wrong in America, huh? It's just like the railroads are super not around. <laughs> like we don't have high speed rails. It's like go to Europe with that shit, Garrick. You know, you gotta don't bring that railroad bullshit into America, okay? We're 
we're going to invent uh, big old flying machines over here, baby. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> so uh, all this sort of stuff starts in 1873, four years before the strike actually happened. Um, in 1873, there was a depression and uh, Garrick had to cut the salary of the workers, uh, but none of the executives got their salaries cut. So um, workers lost a bunch of their salary. The executives were fine. Um, and then again in 1877, four years later, he cut the salary of the worker by 10% again because the depression wasn't getting any better, right? So he decided to cut the salary of the worker by 10%. He got together with all of his executives, with all his board, with all these people. Again, closed door meetings. None of the stuff was public. Nobody really knew about this sort of stuff, right? Um, got together with them. And he was like, we're going to cut the salaries by 10%. Um, and uh, uh, he, he canceled all of the other meetings for the summer of 1877 because uh, John Garrick believed that the working class that the employees of the railroad would be so excited about this pay cut because it would be benefiting Garrick and the executives and the company itself that they canceled all of the other meetings that they would have in regards to how to bet better the company, right? They like, he literally was just like, people are going to be so excited that we are going to get richer in a depression. You have no idea. People love us. Okay, people love us. They they love rich people. Uh, and boy, howdy, was he super fucking wrong. Because people went to get their paychecks. They found out that their pay had been cut by 10%. And they were fucking pissed. They were pissed, obviously, right? Like, has anybody been like, you know, I think I'm making too much money. Um, I have never uh, said that because I've never made <laughs> what could be amounted to too much money. Uh, because I've been poor most of my life. Uh, so <laughs> I've never, I've never, like, I've never had to fucking say that before in my life. <laughs> so in Baltimore, in the Camden Yards, they launched a strike and they were like, no more. Fuck this shit. We're done. We're striking. Um, and then it, it caught fire, right? Like everybody was doing it. Chicago, uh, Pittsburgh, Frostburg, West Virginia, like all of these places started striking too, right? And it became like this um, railroad industry general strike is essentially what it was, right? There's very specific um, general strikes. So then the militias got involved, right? Because a lot of these strikers, um, this, this just wasn't about the railroad industry in and of itself, it was it was about the families because their pay was dependent, you know, like the, these guys were usually it was a single this day, you know, late 1800s. So I, like not, a, you know, women weren't really working. Um, so it was a lot of a uh, lot of like uh, uh, single paycheck families um, losing their their means of sustaining themselves and all this other thing. So uh, and then a lot of their f uh, family members of the strikers were in the militias that had formed um, after the civil war. And so, uh, so the militias were also involved in these strikes themselves. Um, and the militias got disbanded. Their, their uh, legitimacy got taken away from them for, for fraternizing with strikers. This is another thing of just like, if you, it, well, I wouldn't even have a beer with that. That guy doesn't seem like you can have a beer. You know what I mean? Like you've, you've heard that argument before. Like I don't like Julian Assange because I can't have a beer with him. I can't see myself having a beer with him. You know, it, and, and this, this one is like the militia people were having beer beers with the strikers. And they were like, no, <laughs> somebody you can have a beer with. How fucking dare you? Uh, so president Rutherford B. Hayes um, in order to kind of uh, push back against the strikers, uh, sent the army to shut the strikes down. That's what he did. Um, because the militia was taking their side, they were marching, uh, and, you know, the army would show up, and they would be like, what the fuck is this? And Rutherford B. Hayes went as far as to set up Gatling guns in Baltimore. He set up Gatling guns, and the, and the, and the company that was making these Gatling guns uh, literally penned a letter apologizing to the president being like, Hey, 
Um, super sorry, our bad. We can't make Gatling guns fast enough. Um, sounds like the people in the Gatling gun factory need to unionize, huh? Um, you know, to to ask for better working conditions to make Gatling guns to kill other strikers. Uh, maybe they should have gotten together and organized a strike in the Gatling gun industry to not make Gatling guns to kill other strikers. That could have been a demand. <laughs> We'll just, we'll make you guns, but only if you're not going to use it on strikers. That could have been a fun demand. So, uh, because, because the government essentially like panicked and this, and this is sort of the, the, the trend that you always see when, when, when these movements show up is that the, the powers that be, the people, the people up in the, in the realms of power, uh, freak the fuck out. They lose their shit and they, um, they they immediately turn to like violence, right? They're like, we got to get the military involved. We got to get the police involved. We're we're deputizing children. How many kids can carry rifles? Give them all rifles. We we gotta. Uh, wh- who else? Uh, dogs? Can we get, can we put uh, guns inside the mouth of a dog uh, and just have it kind of throw the gun? At these strikers, what? Who can we deputize? We gotta make sure that we are still in power. <laughs> they like freak the fuck out, um, and then the strikers will, you know, it, eventually there there was less violence involved in these strikes. But in 1877, the strikers decided to retaliate. Right, like they were putting Gatling guns in Baltimore, um, and so in order to kind of make sure that these militias weren't getting disbanded, weren't getting delegitimized, and everything like that. Uh, what they would do is, uh, they would send, um, militias from one side of the state to the other. Like they would trade, uh, uh, spots. Uh, so Philadelphia's militia would be in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh's militia would be in Philadelphia. Uh, so that like the authorities didn't know that these were militia people, right? They would just think that they were other strikers or whatever. Uh, and the strikers and the militias who were all, uh, either, uh, veterans of the Civil War, or so, you know, they they were somehow connected to the Civil War. They knew military tactics, fought back against this um, against the army uh, that was being sent to to stop them from just peacefully assembling, right? And like they weren't being violent anyway. So now that there was this threat of violence, uh, the strikers decided to burn some shit down. They burned rail yards down. They burned bridges down. They burned these factories down, right? Because that's because they were afraid that they were going to have, they were going to be killed. So they retaliated. Um, and, uh, and Hayes continued to bring more troops. He went to Fort McHenry uh, and, uh, and on the behalf of the BNO brought out uh, the American military uh, to try to kill strikers. And this was a um, a problem because it went back against his promise of reconstruction, which is that troops would not be uh, released and used against civilians in the South. And here he is releasing troops to go to Baltimore. Again, he's already he's already got troops out in Baltimore. He's got Gatling guns in Baltimore. He's putting out more uh, troops from Fort McHenry that are going to Baltimore, which is technically below the Mason-Dixon line. So he's going back on his word. Um, just to make sure, just to make sure that we the people don't get organized, that we the people don't uh, seize the means of our own production, that we don't gain some level of power, right? That we don't get the rights that we we should be getting. Just so we don't get that. So eventually, you know... Um, as things kind of escalated, a uh, bunch of shit blew up, a bunch of shit burned down. Uh, there's a there's a whole bunch of violence. Uh, eventually, it was like, we got to stop. You know, this is getting over the top. Uh, there was the first national labor le- legislation that got signed because of the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. And it was called the National Railway Labor Act. Um, and had it not been... Because had it not um, been because of the strike of 1877, there were other railroad strikes um, throughout the rest of the 1800s, uh, throughout the rest of the the, the 20 some odd years that were left of the uh, 1800s. There, um, 
had it not been for this initial one, this wouldn't have happened. They would they would not have gotten um, they would not have gotten this this national labor legislation done. And and really, what it came down to is that these workers were willing to sacrifice themselves. They were willing to sacrifice um, a lot of shit in order to um, in order to get what they needed to get. In order to be treated properly, in order to be to to be compensated properly, in order to fight for their human rights, um, and that's really what it takes. And we saw that in the in the 1934 uh, uh, general strike of San Francisco, um, that that the strikers weren't going to let up, um, and and that was another example where uh, there was a lot of police brutality. The the army and the national guard were called. Uh, uh, two two people died. Uh, like seventy people were were injured. You know, and uh, um, but they got what they needed to get. They got the Wagner Act in place. They got they they were they were able to get a twelve percent wage increase. They were able to uh, get away from having to bribe um, uh, shipyard bosses and things of that sort. They they were able to get what they needed to get. So if we stick with these strikes, if we stand in solidarity um, with each other then there's a very, very good likelihood that despite the tactics of violence, despite the tactics of um, media manipulation and propaganda and lies being spread around uh, of, 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 you know, communism and all this other shit, um, which, you know, the unions are not communists uh, and, and socialism isn't communism. The, those are all sort of the propaganda things that get thrown out there. Despite all of that, if we stand together, if we stand in solidarity, we can get what we need to get. We will be treated fairly. We will be treated um, the right way and we will win. We will win. Um, and that's that's what all these uh, these these strikes from from the last you know 200 years show is we need to stand Together, we need to stand in solidarity with each other. Uh, so once again, I, I, I hope that that's what you'll do. Um, because if, if I may steal a quote from um, the, the, the leader of uh, the airline labor union, um, the strike is the tactic. Solidarity is our power. Uh, so I hope that you, you take that with you going forward because we are going to see some strikes. And the media is not going to cover it, so it's going to be it's going to be more like independent people and fucking comedians that talk about this shit. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's do our final little thing that I want to talk about, um, and it goes to I think I covered this last week um, in terms of herd immunity and uh, and sort of the what we can do to to get out of the situation that we are in in a in a reasonable manner. Uh, and, uh, I don't have a banner made for this. So you're just going to see my name, uh, for this part. Um, and basically, um, everybody's talking about flattening the curve. I think we need to get down to correcting the curve. Um, because there's a lot of measures that we haven't taken, uh, in order to get to that flattening. And then what do we do after we flatten the curve? Right. Do we just send people back out? Do we you know, we need we need a plan and we don't have one right now. Right. Um, so one of the things I talked about was herd immunity, which is uh, some people getting uh, the 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 infection itself, the virus itself and building antibodies um, and then, you know, donating plasma, all that sort of stuff. So, so we know what we're doing and we have some herd immunity in our society. Uh, so that when this thing happens next, we don't have to shut everything down. Now, it's not to say that that the social distancing and this quarantining thing is necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's going to, it, it's not one or the other. Uh, that's sort of the argument that I made last week. It's not one or the other. I think we have to take multiple steps, multiple different types of um, precautionary measures and put them into place and come up with a plan uh, for each step. So that we can do that. So what, here, here's sort of the recap of it is, is what we didn't do. What we should have done initially when these th stories started popping up in February um, was immediately start testing, uh, immediately finding testing facilities uh, to make sure that, that, you know, this thing hasn't spread beyond what we think it has. Um, and uh, the, the way that we, we do that is by kind of saying time out. Uh, for the next uh, three to four weeks, we're on a timeout in this country. Um, we're going to erect a bunch of uh, facilities where you can go get tested 
and uh, and you're going to socially distance from each other. You're going to quarantine from each other. If you are are proven positive to test, go home, take care of yourself, come back, get retested, uh, see if you have antibodies, see if, if you're willing to donate some plasma so we can see how these antibodies work to create a vaccine. Um, and and then we're going to send you back out into the world. You can live your life as you would as you would choose to live your life. So now we're talking about how the social distancing and the quarantine should have been put into effect. So we did it far too late in, in the States. That's just the, the reality of the situation is um, the, the social distancing measures were taking a month after, right? We, we always kind of seem to be a month behind in these sort of logical reasoning things is we're, we're always about a month behind. Um, so we didn't do that. So now we are, and that's fine. Um, you know, because I do think that it's probably helping, but, um, I think a lot more people have it. And, and, and the reason why a lot more people, I think a lot more people have it than, than we are aware of is we like to sit there and criticize, oh, well, China's not giving us accurate numbers. Well, at least you're fucking giving us numbers. Like we don't have that luxury because we just haven't fucking done the testing. We haven't done mass testing. We got tents in New York. We didn't build facilities. We didn't build hospitals. We didn't equip fucking, um, a, a medical infrastructure that can handle this thing. We're just making the situation worse by by now calling the e- economy to to a halt, having a, millions and millions of people um, go in, into unemployment, lose their point of income, lose their health insurance. Lo- lo- you know, so it's like we we threw the whole thing into chaos in an effort to help, and it's not helping anymore, right? So we saw what Sweden did. Um, I talked about this on my podcast, Have a Table Talk, which is essentially that Sweden. Um, they just kept things going and uh, kind of shrunk things down a little bit. So no gatherings of 500 plus people. If you're, if you're a restaurant, do table service. Uh, keep universities open, but shut down school for little kids. Uh, if you're elderly, if you're immunocompromised, go ahead and socially distance yourself. Go ahead and quarantine yourself. Don't come out. Take the precautions that you need to. If you're feeling ill, uh, all of our hospitals have these tests. These tests will not cost you anything. Go get tested. If you feel like you must get tested, we're going to report these numbers. Um, and everybody got tested and their numbers were virtually the same as Norway, which has uh, less people and Norway completely locked itself down. So you have two countries um, that are, are, you know, arguably less populated than um, than America is, but they handled it completely different. My argument is that we should be doing all of these things in in this wave. So now we've socially distanced people and now, but where was the testing that came up after it? There were no testing facilities that came up. I didn't hear of anything. And everybody that I feel like I hear test positive, they go to the doctor and they have to pay like 150 bucks to get this test, which is crazy because in a time where where people's income and livelihood is is come to a grinding halt, Nobody can just shell out 150 bucks for a test. You should just be letting these people take the test and figure it out. Um, so what I think we need to do is correct the curve. That's what we should be talking about. We're a month behind what we need to do. How do we catch up with the rest of the world? Why aren't, why are we not looking at the way Korea dealt with it? Why are we not looking at the way that Sweden dealt with it and saying, okay, we're a little behind. What can we do to, to kind of correct what we need to correct? You know, people do this shit with drinking all the time. You know, they show up to a party late. They're, they're about six beers in and they're just like, fuck it. Let's waterfall. Get me the beers. I'm going to beer bong all these things. Like, why aren't we doing, why aren't we taking that philosophy and applying it to this global pandemic? Let's beer bong a solution. Let's do that. Can we can we do that? I'm putting it in terms that America might understand. If we can beer bong a solution to the global pandemic, that would be great. We're talking about flattening the curve. We should be talking about correcting the curve. We should be implementing um, a an emergency UBI for the people. Uh, we should be implement, and it should be regardless of what your income is. You should be getting two thousand dollars, and it should be a monthly payment. Uh, all of the testing should be free. Testing facilities need to be implemented immediately. Um, social distancing guidelines should be taken, but it shouldn't be taken to the point where people aren't building up their own immunities and they aren't able to um, correctly like donate plasma to to do research. 
to come up with a vaccine to this thing. Um, and we should be able to get back on track after that, but we're not doing that. We just kind of keep, um, uh, keep taking things so fucking slow and it's not helping anybody. Okay. All right. I think that's, I think we're going to, uh, it's not a very helpful end, uh, to the live stream. <laughs> Uh, just more of like a, Hey, here's some, here's an idea that I thought up of. Um, maybe somebody will listen to it or probably not. I don't fucking know. Uh, but I'm going to say it anyway and put it out into the universe. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out. Thank you guys for, for leaving comments, um, and checking out this live stream. Thank you to the people that shared it. That's super cool of you guys to do. Uh, the, the, Brenda Leeds, tell us a joke. Oh God. (laughs) but there were so many in, in the live stream. I talked about uh, making fun of Jeff Bezos and his dumb head. <laughs> it's the worst thing you could ask a comedian to do. <laughs> Tell us a joke. Ah! <laughs> you're, you're welcome. I appreciate it. If, if, I, if I'm not going to be funny, I'll at least be interesting. That is my life motto. That is my life motto. Uh, seriously, thank you guys for tuning in. I'll be back next Sunday to do this live stream. Um, I will um, I will be posting this up on the YouTubes. I'll be clipping these out. Uh, and, hey, thank you, Brenda. I appreciate it. That's very nice of you to say. Uh, but as as always, a, a, a really, really good way to, to help is if you have the ability to, by no means is this a, a requirement for you to enjoy these videos, uh, is, is donating. If you can, you can go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. It's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com slash donate. Uh, you can become a sustaining member. You can make a one-time donation. Uh, and the biggest way that you can help is by sharing and subscribing to this page. Make sure you hit that bell notification. That lets you know uh, every time I'm premiering a video, every time that I have uh, I go live. Um, I, I'm thinking about going live more often. I'm not really sure. I'm thinking about maybe just doing that as as the uh, general check in uh, thing that I do um, at the top of these shows is is uh, just go live and and talk to you guys about like where my head is at, uh, what's going on with me, what are some updates, things of that sort. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I'm kicking that idea around um, because I do like going live and and talking to you guys and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, and it'll be a little bit more of a of a laxed casual conversation uh just just about the day and about you know emotions and 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 uh, mental states and physical states and uh all that sort of stuff and kind of keep me accountable for for take for 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 my own shit as well um i'm also trying to figure out how to do a live show via zoom or via some sort of platform similar to zoom because there seem to be some issues with zoom i guess uh, so I'm kind of uh, certain some of those things out. Uh, details will be coming out for that pretty soon. I'm going to do a test show, which will be free. And then I'll probably do like five bucks to to do a Zoom show, something along those lines. Um, and uh, yeah, and then my album's going to be coming out soon, uh, which will which will be pay what you want. It'll be available on all the streaming shit, uh, but it'll it'll wind up being uh, a pay what you want on Bandcamp. Um and there are going to be two different versions of the album. Uh, and, and then I'll put out a video. I'll put out some video clips from the show as well, but they will be from uh, like eight months before I recorded the album. So some of the jokes will be in this odd transitionary state. Uh, so uh, yeah, but it'll be fun. It'll be a different, different kind of uh, version of the material uh, that, uh, that you guys can enjoy. Uh, but uh, seriously, I, I really appreciate you guys hanging out and, and, and being in the chats and all that sort of stuff. Um, I know this is, this is sort of a long, a longer live stream. Uh, the topic of the topics of discussion, uh, I seem to be getting are, are more and more in depth <laughs> and I'm already so fucking long winded. Uh, so I appreciate you guys sticking through it. I appreciate you guys watching, um, watching, watching these live streams. Um, like I said, every Sunday we'll be doing it. 
Uh, there's an event page up already, and I'll resend out the invites every week to to make sure that you guys know what's up. And I'm posting all the videos uh, that I'm doing from the week in that event page as well. So I'm kind of using that as a mini hub for if uh, for for content, just in case content uh, gets lost in the ether, as it so often does. Um, but uh, but yeah, okay. I think I think that's it. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everybody. Um, thank you guys for hanging out. Uh, do the do all the things that you do. Uh, be good to each other. Take care of each other. Uh, Brenda leads John Sheon. They're they're going to be live streaming when particles collide. They live stream. I've got a bunch of friends that uh, do some amazing things. Go support them. I love you guys. Bye.